Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth episode of my podcast series, Invested. In this series, we have sat down with founders, investors, and finance professionals making an impact on this world. And today's guest is a perfect combination of all of these things. Today, I get the chance to chat with Jack Boudreaux. You may have seen Jack on your For You page on TikTok where he's amassed millions of views and over 13,000 followers talking about his professional experiences. Jack started his career in banking at JP Morgan. He later pivoted to the private bank where he helped lead the Chicago offices FIG team. After moving up the ladder at JPM, Jack decided he wanted to pursue venture capital. So he joined Techstars as an associate and advised numerous startups and accelerators on go-to-market strategy and operations. After traveling all over the world, advising these various enterprises and early stage startups, Jack saw a gap in the market for young professionals and high potential earners when it came to finding financial advisors. So with that problem in mind, Jack co-founded and is the CEO of Habits, a personal finance marketplace for those who outgrew the do-it-yourself personal finance lifestyle, but don't yet qualify to work with a private banker or wealth advisor. From landing a role at the most powerful bank in the world as a non-target student to going viral on TikTok for his storytelling, Jack has quite the background and has so much value to offer to anyone who has the time to listen. I thoroughly enjoyed every second of my conversation with Jack, and I'm sure you will too. And with that, let's get into the episode. All right, Jack, thank you so much for joining us. You have had quite the career so far, from starting at JP Morgan to then having a stint in VC to now being a co-founder and entrepreneur on your own. Would love to kind of just learn a little bit more about that trajectory and more specifically, what it was that made you take that step from each of these these different career spots. So I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, I mean, all great questions and, and happy to be here. I, I'm just very high level, Cameron. I've always subscribed to the mentality that most things in life whisper. They don't really shout at you. So you know what I mean, right? Yep. So when I was younger, I grew up with both my parents working in the nonprofit industry. So like I had no idea how to start a business, but I knew how to raise a dollar. I knew how to stretch a dollar. I knew how to put purpose behind one. So literally the first company or business I started was the moment I got to college. You know, started a couple of nonprofits. So I'm like, okay, I, I have an entrepreneurial mindset. But when the JP Morgan offer comes to your, you know, comes to you and your mom is sitting next to you, they're like, yeah, mom, I'm gonna be making six figures out of school. Like you're taking that. So it doesn't matter what other entrepreneurial uh, you know, you know, I don't know, gifts and or desires that I had. It's like, I'm gonna go do this. And right. when I was at uh JP Morgan, you know, did the analyst program, moved to the Chicago office because Naturally, I just over time was saying to myself, you know what? I want to be home. Like, I want to be in Chicago. I want to be where all my friends are. Um, and yeah, sure, you know, I, it required me to make a couple internal pivots, but sure. it was really exciting learning new teams, learning new markets. And the decision to go to VC, once again, was, you know, basically eight, nine months before my ultimate decision to leave JP Morgan. And I guess this is like 2022 ish. Um, I was like, I love these VC clients I'm working with. I, I was, uh, you know, I always say co-lead the financial insurance sure. group team, but basically it was the managing director and I was the eager guy running around. But yeah, talked with all these VC funds, all these startup people. And I'm like, man, these people are cool. Like I want to do what they do. And that's yeah. kind of led me to where I am today. Yeah. Well, well, fantastic. I, I can definitely relate um, to a lot of that. And kind of going into the, the next question, I mean, that leap to VC, you know, what was it that was so exciting about that? I mean, I, I know from the TikToks you've created is just the passion and the energy yeah. and the fact that people were working on problems that needed to be solved. Whereas, you know, as much as finance is great, a lot of the times it's just moving money around and other things like that. So would love to just hear a little bit more about that experience. You know, maybe the some, some fond memories working with startups. Because I know that is also one, one thing that I'm interested in, but I also know the audience you know, is also still navigating. Do I want to go the super corporate route or more yeah. of the sort of entrepreneurial side? It's, it's hard, right? Because you get the safety and security of working out at a large company, but the thrilling where every day actually is more different, um, right. which often gets preached upon regardless of where you go to, you know, you always hear very common things like, oh, we'll work hard, play hard, or every day is different. But, you know, at a startup where you, and, and when I say startup, I don't mean, Series A, ten million in funding. You're right. you're, you're employee number two hundred. I'm saying, hey, you know, you're one of the first. You're you're like the first person 
that right. is for that department, right? You're one of the first 20 employees at anything where legitimately one day you might be doing a, you know, you know, a financial model with the CEO of the company, but then the next you might be helping out with sales. Like, you know, you can be stretched in so many different directions. But um, to your point about why VC, I I kind of looked at my banking career, Cameron, and I knew that I had mastered 80% of the job. Sure. And it was going to take another, what, maybe 20 to 30 years to master the last 20%. And I knew that if I'd left, I could always come back. And, and that has been said and kind of reaffirmed, which is still nice to hear. But yeah. we, but why VC? These people were always on the edge of crazy and innovation, if that makes yeah. sense. And so, and, and I just, I don't know, it just fit my personality. Uh, I love the big swinging mentality of like, let's just yeah. go into this. And yes, you hear about AI nowadays, you know, before it was maybe blockchain prior to like, you know, we can say all these different, maybe like phases of new technology that come through that people get really excited about. But these are things that VCs and startups are talking about a decade before. Right. That people don't recognize. Would like to understand a little bit more about how you just even went about making that switch. I understand you you were working, you know, amongst these companies, these funds, maybe at JP Morgan. um, But it seems like when you when you took that leap, it was learning a little bit more about it. It was a bit of a three month contract and then yeah. you kind of were going to be interacting with a lot of different spaces. And then from there can kind of decide where you want to go. We'd love to kind of just learn a little bit more about what that was like. And especially kind of the the switch from a very structured corporate job to then now being in a three month contract that's a little bit up in the air. Yeah. So literally what I did, I think it was probably nine months before I ultimately said like goodbye to my team at JP Morgan. I started kind of leveraging the JP Morgan brand to get in front of VCs and startups. But then right. once I met with them, I would progress the, you know, Jack Boudreau agenda. And, you know, I- I'm sure if JP Morgan was hearing this today and they saw some expenses that I'd be at dinners or at happy hours or things like that, they would probably go back with a with, with a comb and be like, you know, Jack, yeah. this is actually for JP Morgan or really for yourself. But, you know, that was the benefit of the role that I was in. And I think that's right. why I was able to take advantage because it did lead sometimes to JP Morgan business. But for the most part, yeah. I got to get like raw and honest with some of these people. But I always had a foot in the door. And then uh, I failed a lot, Cameron, because I, I just kind of took for granted, like, okay, I've been at JP Morgan for five years. I can take this and go anywhere, right? I should be able to right. walk into HBX and go to Harvard Business School, or I should be able to walk into Sequoia and be able to get a job there. Right? It was not that. It was actually a rude awakening because I had no operating experience. Right. And so for nine months, all these meetings that I was having, even though it was helping educate me, it wasn't actually getting me to a new role. So the contracting position was me literally going on the Techstars website, applying for a bunch of different, you know, associate roles. But yeah. they gave me a call a month after I'd applied, totally forgot. It's like April, probably around like this time, you know, a few years ago. Right. And 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 the principal is like, yeah, you're like vastly overqualified for this. Uh, we're really usually looking for people who are like getting their MBA or sure. they're like a kid trying to get like an internship, but like, if you want to join our, our executive leadership team and be like an operator with us, we can offer that to you, but we're only going to pay you 2000 gross a month. And to me, yep. that was enough, right? Because that was, I could then go to my bosses and other clients and just say, Hey, I'm joining a VC. When in reality, I was yep. doing a three month contract with no guarantee of employment. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you, how did you approach that? Knowing that you only had the three months, you know, feeling that you, you probably had to prove yourself. And then also, in that time, you mentioned it yourself, you didn't have that operating experience. So yeah. I'm sure you were trying to just consume a lot of information, get a lot of experience out of those three months. So like, how did you you go through making sure that you made the most of those three months? Because I know it could be easy to be like, oh, it'll all work out. But there's there's a balance there between trusting that it'll work out and actually making it happen. I was terrified. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I was terrified. But yeah, I, I think so many of us in life get very nervous to take bets on ourselves. And, I, and I'm not saying sure. safe bets like, hey, oh, I'm going to go to this great university versus this other great university because I'm going to be a little bit farther from home. I mean, hey, I'm going to leave the the job that pays a quarter million dollars a year right. to really put myself in an uncomfortable situation because I kind of said to myself, Cameron, you know what? I don't have kids. I, you know, at the time, you know, I didn't have like a mortgage that I was really, you know, focused on. I'm like, you know what? I have enough savings. There's never a great time, so why not now? Right. So I think really the decision was just a mental thing. But since I had been focusing so hard 
Uh, not necessarily leaving JP Morgan. I always believe in running to something than running away from something. Sure. But this VC startup, you know, I just became so obsessed with it that I read it. I would have done it for free. And you want to know what? Yeah. Even in the negotiations of the contract, even though they said they could only really pay you 2000 I literally had said to them, I'll do this for free because I was that excited about yeah. what it could lead to. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think that that's an important thing to just explain to, to people when you're going through that process and showing that interest. That's what I always talk about to students and other people maybe looking to pivot their careers. It's, it's important to, to really understand why you want to do that. And it's yeah. more important to be deeply passionate about where you're looking to pivot instead of, you know, A, I want to make more money or more importantly, oh, I just don't like the job that I'm in. Um, so it's, it's a really important thing to kind of understand yeah. exactly why you want to, why you want to take that leap. And I agree, like early on in your career, that's the time to take that risk when you don't have those responsibilities, you know, and also I, I would like to kind of hear how you feel about going too far down into a niche before you pick. Oh, yeah. You're starting out and you're somewhere where realistically it's not where you want to spend your career, but it's still a good paycheck. You'll be promoted in a year. So you're kind of wanting to stick around. Like how do you kind of navigate that mentally in terms of deciding when to take that jump? It That is such a great question because we're often told to specialize. Specialize as much as you possibly can, right? Because now you'll be the subject matter expert. Heck, even, uh, you know, as you know, at JP Morgan, everyone's always saying, hey, whenever there's some sort of new technology that's coming out, whether it's in the investment bank, the private bank, asset management group, wealth management group, Chase, wherever, it's be, yep. the, per be the first adopter there. Be the right. user. Be the one who teaches it to everybody because then you're the go-to person. You're the glue guy or girl who kind of keeps everything afloat in the room. And for me, at least when I moved over to the private bank, you know, I had like some of the most exceptional, um, uh, like Excel skills. And so sure. I did yeah. every, so I did everything for like, we had this like really complicated, um, for lack of better words, like to understand public company executives, executive compensation, you know, going yeah. through the, uh, the form fours of public disclosures yeah. of them selling stock, acquiring stock, whether that's through awards or whatever. And it's like, I was the only one, at least on the Chicago PV floor who could do it sure. outside of maybe a couple people. But, but I bring that up because right, that, that was a specialty of mine and I could go down that path further and further and further. But I think right. until you're ready and you're married to that industry, you kind of owe it to yourself to not be subject to the grass is greener, but step outside of your comfort zone, get right. into other industries because you want to know what you really don't know yourself until you really have put yourself in a place where you're really not familiar with the landscape because that you are forced to like kind of look in and be like, huh, am I enjoying yeah. this? Am I not enjoying this? Am I good? Does this come easy to me or, or does it not? And so kind of right. that answers the question, but that's my philosophy yeah. behind specialization and, and more general. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's super helpful. And some, a similar note that, that I mentioned sometimes is just reflecting on yourself and your own strengths and weaknesses. And what I've said in the past is, you know, if you don't have the, the capability to be the best person, the best in yeah. the world at what you're doing, like maybe it's time to leave and go down something else Absolutely. Um, and, you know, take advantage of those competitive advantages, take advantage of your actual personal strengths. Cause that's how you succeed. Yeah. Um, so and and super, actually, just to piggyback off of that, one thing yeah. that I also want to make clear and, and, and you know, Cameron, you and I are high aspirational career driven people. So, you know, like the way that we think about things is going to be a lot sure. different than maybe the average person. Like I want to make it very clear. There is nothing wrong with being at a nine to five that you're super happy with that either right. pays well, maybe it doesn't pay great, but nonetheless, like if you get fulfillment outside of work and it's yeah. just a means to an end, like that's totally okay. It's your life. I think what you'll agree with me when I say is that the best part about this life is that you get to choose however you go about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect segue into your entrepreneurial pursuit. So yeah, exactly. years at JP Morgan, you know, you're, it's, you had a, an important role, but you weren't Jamie Dimon. Yeah. Then you're, you're an associate at Techstars, you're advising um, startups, but now you, you take the leap with habits. Yeah. What led you down that path, especially to take on something with, with so much gray space to now be your own boss, to be the co-founder, to be in charge of all of that. That's a, that's a major switch. It, it, it is a major switch and you're never going to be ready for it. Th th this is technically my third company, but it's the first where like, Hey, no, this is going to be a company that we plan to have hundreds of employees. We want we sure. this to be a billion dollar entity or else we wouldn't have gone down this path. Right. And that's yeah. a, a totally different trajectory than 
the consulting services business that I ran, right. maybe the dorm room business that you put together with just slapping an LLC and, you know, you, yeah. you know, doing simple things like that. The, the decision to go full time, the decision to actually see this thing through kind of goes back to what I said earlier about like how things kind of whisper at you over time. I had experienced a problem. I, you know, had kind of operated around the audiences of other people who experienced this probably and really the target audience of, you know, who we service with is, you know, people who have outgrown that do it yourself, personal finance lifestyle, but don't yet call, sure. don't have the millions to work with the private banker that Jack was, right? right. But these are all future one percenters. And, yep. and and just like as time grew on and on, I was like, okay, like, well, what's the what's the solution for me in this? Right. You know, I got half a million dollars. I know I wanna you know, start my own business at some point, but now I don't have like income. Like how am I just going to like navigate this thing? And as time went on and on, I just recognized like, wait, this thing could be customized and scaled. And actually the more right. people that use it and are involved with it, the value of it will grow. And that's really the definition of a venture backed business. Right. Yeah. And, and there are network effect opportunities and network effects. When I say that, I just mean that someone is going to tell someone else about it, which will lead right. to more business and more opportunities and better awareness and, and, and better utility. Um, so I think it's a very long winded way of me saying, Cameron, I had no idea, but I just yeah. took the leap because I said, why not? Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's a lot of beauty in that. Um, and then also the fact that you actually, more importantly, probably was that it was a problem that you were facing. I think yeah. a lot of the times, too many of the times people want to just become an entrepreneur. So it's in their, their LinkedIn to say that they're a founder, um, and to be in that circle. But it's, it's very different to actually experience a problem and make the effort to find a solution to it. So speaking of that, can you just tell us more about what you're looking to build with that, the problem that you're solving and kind of just where you see the, the company growing to? Yeah, well, the, the original intent of Habits is still that North Star, right? There are people who have high you know, earnings, are right. young, 27 to 42, uh, they don't yet qualify to work with a super fancy financial advisor, but they want the advice from that type of person. So we want to bridge that gap. And we believe we bridge that ga gap in three different ways. What we do today is just high level, help you source and connect with a financial advisor. We have an application that's on the Google Play and Apple App Store. We actually really don't publicize it because we're switching our backend from Microsoft Azure to AWS. That's some very nitty gritty details. But you know, by April, people are going to be able to go onto this thing be able to access all the advisors that we have hand selected who understand high earners at younger ages and have flexible business models to be able to engage with them. But yep. Habits is far more than just a matchmaker. The The true full vision of Habits is to be a personal financial media brand because, I mean, it makes no sense to me that any 25-year-old or 35-year-old can produce personal finan financial content but has no licensing experience or no, it's not a licensed professional has no experience in this area. I, I you know, don't want to hide free speech. I want people to be able to share and express what's going on. But why is it that licensed professionals and certified financial planners have more oversight and have more regulation behind what they can share when those are the professionals? And so we have this like social media content component that have its plans to fill as well. But then lastly, and more importantly, you know, what's one of the best benefits of having a financial advisor is, you know, knowing what other families like you or individuals like right. you are doing with their family. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's one of the best parts, right? Well, we want to provide that to people because we will be knowing what people are thinking about and what they're concerned about in real time across having them source and connect with a financial advisor, leveraging and um, you know digesting and interacting with our content. And we want to provide that to the people. So think about, right. you know, you're, you're, you just got the big job in New York and you're, you want to move to Nomad or Gramercy or, you know, yeah. Upper West Side or, you know, wherever it is that you want to, you know, post up. You should be able to find out how much people spend on rent relative sure. to your income or your age or yeah. in New York City, right? And all that is publicly available, but we believe it needs to be more publicly accessible. Yeah. And I think that's a huge trend we're seeing. You know, you can't go on TikTok without seeing someone asking on on the street how much they're making. Yeah. And salary transparency and just trans yeah. transparency about finances in general is a huge transition um, that we've seen in recent years. And I, I don't think I'll, that some of those legacy companies are doing enough yeah, that and especially not for the demographic that you're kind of targeting. Um, but would just be curious, what do you see as like the typical questions that that families or high earners might ask? Like, what is it, and maybe where where is it that they're having the most challenge? Where they're like, okay, I can't do this on my on my own anymore. Because I've always been someone, you know, fortunate to to have a good father who talked to me a lot about personal finance, and of course watched Graham Stefan on YouTube. 
Yeah. But it's like, what, at what point does it get to be like, okay, I can't do this on my own anymore. I, I call it the, uh, uh, like the, oh crap moment. That's and it, you know, you're buying your first house, you're having your first kid. Uh, you, you know, maybe you've made a pivot out of corporate life and you took like a director role with a startup and you have like all this equity compensation that's QSBS eligible. Yeah. You know, what, what, when you kind of go like literally, oh crap, this is like no longer about me, myself and I, I need to have a conversation about it because I right. wholeheartedly believe that with the, the growth, growth of artificial intelligence, tech enabled platforms, like th there are some great financial tools and right. other approaches to finances that I do believe people should leverage. But at the very end of the day, a lot of people want access to someone who they just call just to simplify right. things. Right, Cameron, you're a smart guy. You work at a bank. If you have a question, you could probably spend a few hours and figure it out yourself, but why not just call somebody really quickly right. that you know is savvy and has a lot of experience in this area and get it done immediately because people are willing to pay for high right. quality service and high quality um, personalized support. And, and that's ultimately what we are trying to showcase to that pain points of that consumer demographic that we focus on. Right. So yeah, that, that of course is a hot topic right now in terms of AI taking jobs. It, one of the podcasts that I had earlier this year was with someone who's uh, a major macro investor. And he was just talking yeah. about how initially with AI, people were thinking it was going to be the blue collar jobs um, that would go by the wayside. And of course, you know, the, the cashiers at, at the fast food restaurants, that makes sense. But it's still also a you know, with every advancement, you can see also how close it is to taking your job. Yeah. And so I just curious, like from your perspective, you know, of course, the relationship and just having that person that you can actually call is important. But like, what else do you think that someone who may be in a white collar job can kind of do to separate themselves from AI and make sure they're a little bit more AI proof? I it's an excellent question. And we talk about this. Uh, so usually on Sundays, there's around three to four to five other founders who I get with, uh, you know, every couple of weeks. Um, so it's not every Sunday, but the sure. reason why we do that is because we're all at different stages, right? Some have had multiple exits and are, you know, they're the ones in Silicon Valley and Palo Alto in the very, very nice apartments. And then you have like a few like me who are, you know, kind of, we're like, we're, you know, we're beyond a hundred K in annual recurring revenue, but we're not quite at like a million. Sure. So, Yep. We're like still in a degree. And then we have some people who are still like in the idea stage, but they probably have had at least some success elsewhere. And we all kind of collaborate a lot of these topics. And the one thing that really starts to kind of come up time and time again, and it's to answer your question in two different ways. Like where we really see AI growing, especially with consumer fintech, is to be a lot more on the operational side. Um, you know, it, it, it's right now, nowadays, like if you're going into a branch to get things done and like, this is the thing I always gave, JP Morgan, like a hard time, but it's also necessary. I mean, we our, our, our recent investor literally just went and deposited the check because that's how he does things. But, you know, yeah, like so be it. But the, the being able to make op, having operational automated procedures with just a click of the button, that's where I see like AI kind of going right into where fintech works. But when it comes to like, hey, like how can I stay above it? Like how do I stay in touch with it? Be in a customer facing role, be in a relationship management type role where you are working with people because. We are communal creatures and that is yeah. never going to change. Like there's a reason why we have New York City, right? People right. Yeah. inherently love to be together. Now that's a different beast than maybe a small town in in uh, in like Kansas. But once again, sure. there's a reason why we live together. That's just our inherent approach. And I don't really think we see that ever changing because I think that's just a Darwinian sure. principle that we share and how we, and literally how our species survives. So I know that sounds yeah. very, very more no, that's true. high level, but we go through it and talk about it all the time because there's a lot of empowerment that's going to come from it. Because I think if you're in a relationship oriented role, you'll just have to not do as much of the sucky stuff that involves sure. with moving yeah. money or doing operational functions that you just wish could just be done with a click of a button. Yeah. That, that's, that's a very good point. Um, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's like at the top there, you want that that self-actualization and, yeah. and a lot of times that comes from your community and being with other people and and all of that. And I mean, that was something I, of course, live here in New York and that's how I justify paying the <laughs> out in rent. Uh, but also it was one of those things. I mean, I started my career. I, I didn't mention yeah. this before, but I started my career in consulting at KPMG. Okay. I switched to JP Morgan about a year ago. And at KPMG, I was very hybrid. I would go into the office maybe once a week to to see my friends, we get a happy hour drinks. And it was yeah. 
very different than what I had envisioned for my life after college, yeah. especially living in New York. And so I was really excited when I made the switch to JPM and I'm now in the office four days, sometimes five days a week. It, it changes so much. And it's like, it's, it's not necessarily the things that you can quantify, but it's just your feeling at the end of the day that, wow, that felt really great to just have that extra two minute conversation with the person on my team before the meeting started and, and just things like that, that don't happen through zoom. So, um, totally agree I there. I don't agree more with that. Look, yeah. I mean, I ask you this, I mean, when you think about work from home, now that we're like a few years away from like lockdowns, you right. know, peak pandemic, what is your like state of the union opinion on work from home? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, my, my girlfriend actually just started a new job last week and she had okay. been fully remote still from New York city for the last year and a half. Okay. And it's great when you're first starting out. And I mean, I graduated in 2022. So there you go. Then. I graduated after kind of the lockdown cities and that wasn't really an issue anymore, but a lot of the companies were still kind of set in those ways and people had seen the vet, the benefits and the value of being remote. And so I had a lot of my friends who started in fully remote roles and yeah. it's great at the beginning, you know, you can live at home and collect some extra money before saving up and moving to the city or whatever it may be. People really enjoyed it at the beginning. They're like, oh, it's great. But then now that I'm about a year and a half, almost two years out, everybody who's still in those roles is like, I need to change. Like, this isn't what I wanted my life to be. I feel like I haven't grown, you know, professionally, personally, I'm not meeting enough people. And, you know, that's just, that's a huge thing. And it's a demographic shift. And I mean, of course, there's a lot of value in being fully remote. You know, if you're, if you're raising a family or there's, there's a lot of reasons for it, but especially early on in your career, it's just, it's those things that are really important to build those interpersonal skills, especially for those of us who spent a few years in college on Zoom, you know, like we, yeah. we missed out on a lot of that interaction. So I think time will tell uh, how that kind of plays out. But I think a lot of people are kind of lacking a little bit of that de development in terms of comfortability, speaking to people and getting outside of their comfort zone. So we'll see. I, that's, I, that's I, my I agree more. And, and, and that's the, that's like the thing that I really try to talk to not like talk people off the ledge, but when people, I mean, you, whenever you exit a Fortune 500 company on a path to be a founder, you get right. calls all the time of like, what went through your head, right? Because those are two different extremes. Right. Because I work, I've been fully remote, full time, you know, with habits for, you know, six plus, I don't know, eight, nine months or so, right? Right. Uh, before that, I was on a plane every other day, whether that was visiting my long distance girlfriend or that was, doing consulting work for various companies like Puma or Techstars or wherever, where whether it was Vietnam or Germany or, or, or London or like wherever it is that I had to be, it's like, so I've done the, you know, the KPMG consulting kind of life where you're always on a plane running around. I've done the, then the five years of wearing a suit every single day, walking to the office. And now I've spent six months, um, yeah. you know, remote. And, and for me, I'm an extrovert. I need people to bring me energy. And yeah. you know, when I work from home, I do see a material impact on my ability to not necessarily get the job done, but I can, like my girlfriend will tell if I've not had enough human interaction because she'll just be like, you're like all over this. I'm like, you're like the only physical human being I've talked to all yeah. day. And that's, that happens multiple times a week. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that it kind of plays into why you've now started posting on TikTok and yeah. you're getting a lot of yeah. interaction for that. And we'll, we'll get there, but to wrap up kind of the finance talk, I mean, I know you went, you went to Butler, is that yeah. correct? Go, you, yeah. Go Indianapolis. I'm, I'm from Indianapolis originally, so really, I'm a okay. fan of Butler. Um, but a question, I mean, of course, Butler's a great school, but by no means is that the typical school for someone at JP Morgan, where, the, where they went, you know, how, how did you navigate that? And what would your advice be to a student who may want to kind of go down the, the big corporate route, but is from a school that has a little bit less connections to those industries or, you know, even the location. I, you, you have to recognize that you have to take it upon yourself. It, it, yeah. you, you have, I guess the, the best analogy that I often kind of use in a, and I share this on a lot of my TikTok videos is if you're trying to get somewhere, you know, whether that's like a Wall Street bank or you're trying to get into like a McKinsey or BCG or, you know, just some sort of role that ha that's very, very competitive, you have to recognize that if thousands of people want it, then you have to, you have to outwork a thousand people and right. you have to do it independently. So you have to usually spend thousands of hours independently yep. figuring that out. And so what I did at Butler was 
when I came back from a study abroad experience, I, you know, it was like halfway through my junior year. That's when I decided, okay, like I want to get into finance. And yeah. I probably had an Excel sheet that probably then by the end of my senior year, I started in my junior year. By the end of it, I probably had over 1500 names on it. And these were people that I had individual conversations with. So this isn't like yeah. outreach. This is, hey, I've had a conversation with this person. And it, it was from everything from some random credit union in Indianapolis to, yeah. you know, uh, Gold, Goldman Sachs, m and you know, like right. my side, you know, all, all over the place and then did 35 super days. And none of this Butler helped me with. Uh, I had a career right. mentor who I used as like an accountability partner and I would meet with him every two weeks. I'd be like, all right, here's the update on the Excel sheet. Here's right. what I'm doing. He really wasn't adding value with interviews sure. or any in front of people, but I had to figure all of that out. But I think that's the difference between those who make it and those who don't is that right. do you have the ability to be self-sufficient and to figure right. it out? You know, do you need to be given answers? Like when kids DM me on TikTok and they say like, hey, what would you recommend? Or hey, can we like five minutes to call? It's like, you're not listening. Like you're not, you're not trying to think in a creative way how 999 right. other people aren't taking that approach. And also I yeah. think at Butler, I had a long-term mindset. So I said to myself, okay, maybe I won't get into like this analyst program. Um, but I'll get to, you know, that role by 25 or 30. And I think that's the most right. important thing. Yeah. Keep a long-run mentality. Things don't often happen on your terms. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I, I went to school at the University of Florida, which is a great school, but by no means is kind of that typical pipeline to yeah. job on Wall Street. And so for me, I mean, of course, you'd have the, the companies come and recruit on campus. And it was still big Fortune 500 names. But it was for the Atlanta office, for the Tampa, Miami office, whatever yeah. it may be. So it's like, sure, yes, plenty of people from UF went to KPMG, but no one really in New York. And you know, the again, the what I was mentioning before, it's like find your competitive advantage. You know, yeah, in an application, whatever it may be, because yeah. as much as you think you go to a good school, you have a good GPA, you have good campus involvement, everybody else applying has that too. So really finding those ways to to differentiate yourself. And I really love what you said about the the Excel spreadsheet. I did something similar um, after kind of having a failure of applying for internships that, you know, yeah. I still had a great internship, but it wasn't kind of up to what I really wanted. And so senior year, when I was applying for full-time roles, I made an effort that for every single job I applied for, I wanted to at least have a conversation with two people, you know, either at the company or related to that role. Good. Yeah. And so from there, it was just amazing kind of how quickly those calls and those relationships could compound where, you know, fortunately at UF, it's a big school. So a lot of times you have at least some sort of connection to a company. Yeah, but it was just amazing how okay, I'll have one conversation. They'll introduce them to, or introduce me to their manager, and like it was unbelievable. Like the amount of offers that I got, where it seemed like really that was quick. Like you know, do I really deserve that? Yeah. Um, so that was just a really interesting thing that I I always just implore everybody to do. It's really easy now, especially to just spam the applications. You know, it's all Google autofill, but it's really important to to stand out. And of course, you know, a lot of people are still having those conversations and networking, but. It really is one of those things that's just overlooked. And, you know, if you're at one of those schools, you can't just be reliant on your guidance counselor and your missions people to really help you because that's just, you know, that's not how it works. Cameron, it actually gives me hives when I take the time to speak to a student and we're five minutes into the conversation and I hear like they haven't spoken to their career mentor. They haven't, like all they've done is apply on Handshake or on LinkedIn. Sure. And I'm like, oh my God, like, you're you're not even you haven't begun yet. You you, you yeah. what, what you have done is you've gotten like the the comfort of putting yourself out right. there. But yeah. in and in in it's kind of like the mentality of like why I decided to start posting on TikTok because you yeah. the greatest way to learn more about yourself to learn your competitive advantage is get yourself out there, fall right. forward, fall on your face. I mean, I will never forget Cameron. I went to a super day at BMO Harris. I had to drive up to Chicago for it. Uh, from Indianapolis, I'm in the car, and you know, like you know, like those uh, like coffee thermoses where like when you have to unravel, but it's still get, it's kind of like a hydro flask, right? Where it's not sure. like a sippy cup kind of a thing. And at some point, I was like just sipping it, and like, I don't know what happened, like a bump, and just all of it fell right on me. And so mm. I walk into that interview with just a massive coffee sink. So I was already two hours from the drive. It's like, right. what am I gonna yeah. do? But you want to know what? Then whenever I went on to another interview. Any super day, I always packed a second shirt with me. Like, there you go. I, I, it just, it's yep. all those like little things that you then learn to make sure that 
any opportunity you have, you can take advantage of it. But uh, it just talking about this just kind of reminded me and set me off because yeah. I, I'm so passionate about the people who put in the work to get to where yeah. I want to be. Yeah. And I mean, it, it totally is a muscle, you know, yeah. to exercise. You mentioned being in 35 super days. I'm sure by the end there, you felt really comfortable um, talking about yourself. And of course, there's the technical aspect to it. But that's another thing that I say to people. Yeah. Like, the technicals are the bare minimum, you know, yeah. like you have to have that down, but it's really important to just be able to reflect on your background and think, you know, oh, what is some adversity that I faced on a team and how to, you know, overcome it and things like that. Like being able to kind of explain who you are and what your value prop is also is so important. And that's one of those things where it, you really have to just get to that point through having a lot of those conversations. And that's what was helpful for me is with my YouTube channel, I was a lot of the times explaining my experiences and you know, just talking out loud and especially talking to a camera on, or yeah. a webcam, whatever it may be. <laughs> that proved extremely helpful then when it was everything on Zoom. I was like, oh, this is yeah. this is, uh, first nature for me. Um, but yeah, just really interesting kind of that story. And yeah, I am, um, you know, always, always bring a second um, shirt. I, oh, so I, I, signature. I still have never actually had an interview in person, which is crazy. That, see, I, see, that's what I just realized. Wild. Because cause, yeah. uh, I, I don't know if I've ever... I, I, hopefully I've shared this publicly at least at one point, but when I interviewed for the JP Morgan analyst program, I, uh, I was like an off cycle hire, right? Like I was not an intern. Right. So they only contacted me because basically one or two kids like dropped out last minute to go do something else. And they're like, you know, we got to get some new resumes up in here and interview people. I was traveling in Europe. I had just gone to a Cutco orientation when I finally got the offer. But three weeks before that, I was traveling with friends in Europe. You know, I'd saved up some money doing this Charles Schwab apprenticeship thing where basically I was working part time in their call center. Right. But once again, doing whatever I could to get some sort of experience. Right. And so I'm like in Belgium or something like that, doing the higher view in like a yeah. hostel where I had like 10 minutes to answer these questions. And like right. the lighting was all weird and I was super uncomfortable. But to your point, I had done so many super days that I was so numb to all these processes. Like I knew exactly what to say, how to say it. I didn't have to make any expression. Then when I did the interview in like Budapest, when it was like midnight my time, but it was like 4 p.m. their time, like they're asking me questions where I'm wearing like my last clean t-shirt. I'm not even shaved. That ended up being like a running joke at the bank that, you know, Jack totally did deserve to be in because he didn't do the first thing, which is look presentable. And sure. but every time they asked me a question, I had answered it so many times not only could right. i just do it in my sleep i could do it with confidence right. i could be calm i would be yeah. slower more articulate and i think that's what some people forget and it ties back to what right. i said about competitive advantage my competitive advantage was that i was really good at getting it yeah my weakness was that i was robotic spoke way too fast and that came off as nervous when in reality that's sure. who i am so yeah. for some people sometimes you just got to create your own luck yeah, totally. And, you know, it was, I think, said in a different podcast, but, you know, a lot of times when you're faking being confident, you know how it appears to the other person that you're still confident. Um, so really interesting there. And hey, the the higher views from Hungary, that, that's a good story. But <laughs> now, speaking, speaking of that confidence and just your, your eloquence and all of that, that's also a skill. Let's talk about your TikTok. You know, Yikes, yeah. everybody I'm sure in this, who's watching this now has seen one of your TikToks, whether they clicked on it or the algorithm sent it their way, you know, what kind of prompted you to to start that? And then especially to kind of go down the path that you went on where it was really kind of just conversational. It wasn't like, yeah. oh, let me read off a list. It was really kind of just your insights um, or anecdotes from a certain time. So like what, what made you start that? Cameron, I wish I had uh, a better answer, but I'm still kind of figuring it out. With, yeah. when, I, when I first went to TikTok, it, it was one of those things where my girlfriend, ha like literally, I didn't even have the app until probably six months ago. Um, and then a month, in, so I was just kind of getting a feel for, I'm like, why is everyone talking about this? But what I fell in love with was the authenticity of a few of the, you know, producers of like content on there. Right. Um, people would be just radically transparent about like a day in the life of an investment banker or, hey, here's what I do as a software engineer. And and I became, and I, and I fell in love with that because- I think what TikTok did and does such a good job at is we're so used to following the CEOs and the serial entrepreneurs, the Gary V's, right? You know, the David Goggins, people who 
have massive personalities, hundreds right. of millions of followers and, and, and you know, you know, viewers. And, and it's so hard to relate to those people because yes, yeah. they would share their experiences from 20, 30 years ago, or maybe what they're going through today. But it's just you know, like, I'm 25 or I'm 29 or, you know, I'm 18 year old trying to get to find his baby. Like, that's just so hard. So TikTok right. just showed me, Hey, people will be raw and honest and blunt on here. And I thought to myself, Okay, like I've had some unique life experiences. You know, I did an investment banking internship in Shanghai. I spent years at JP Morgan. You know, I could probably help people out with their resume. And, and I just felt to myself, you know what? Also, what a great way to also kind of get the confidence to talk about habits out there. And I guess you could say that maybe that's way in a long winded way of why I decided to get started on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, TikTok is amazing. I mean, despite all of the bad press it gets and you know, it's one of those things that you can kind of, you know, you're in charge of your own destiny on TikTok. Yeah. You know, yeah, they can, you can go down a rabbit hole and beyond just, you know, not watching good stuff and it's just really just filler, but you can also kind of curate it to be very educational content where you're learning a lot. And, you know, that's a really helpful thing for me where I've kind of curated it to be a point where, okay, I'll learn, I'll deep dive about certain private equity topics and yeah. things like that, where I never would otherwise like kind of get in front of that on a day to day or even, you know, choose to read. So it's really interesting um, kind of how that's all all worked for you. Has it been really beneficial for your business? I know you've made some LinkedIn posts yeah. kind of about some some TikToks that you've made and how some of the audience like reacts a certain way. But then you're always surprised at you know, how many leads it kind of generates. Like what is what is the business impact been of being so public on on TikTok? It's been astonishing um tiktok is easily now our primary source of of new business um e easily I, I mean i've always been somewhat engaged on linkedin but not sure. at the scale that i am today i definitely was starting earlier on linkedin and tiktok was just like okay we gotta eventually come out of here because actually right. contrary to what people might think pure research center actually recently came out with a study that uh, of U.S. Americans or people who live in the U.S. who have t TikTok downloaded, 40% of them are millennials. It's actually now the larger audience. So people yeah. say, hey, it's just 18-year-olds. I like, no, it's not. On my videos, at least 52% of the, and I can see all this information because they allow me to like, kind of screen through my data, a video that gets 100,000 views or 1,000 views, I can see all of this. And yeah. an overwhelming majority of the time, the people who are looking at it are between the ages of 27 and 42 which is exactly the demographic that we focus on at Habits. And so I think maybe we probably get, I'll, I'll say ballpark, we probably have made at least 150K in new business within the last quarter just because of TikTok. Wow. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, yeah, it's, it's one of those tools where then, especially when you look at the financial industry, it's one of those things that a lot of those legacy companies don't want to adopt. And so it really creates a lot of that opportunity there for someone who does choose to be a little bit more innovative or cutting edge, um, you know, to really come in and, and take, I mean, you see it, you saw it with Goldman and Marcus, yeah. you know, starting all these things to kind of tap into that younger millennial demographic, but hasn't really had a lot of success with it. So it's just really, you know, interesting how, and I mean, kudos to you. It, it's not all just right place, right time. It also comes down to creating some great content for it. But yeah, I mean, that's awesome. And it's something that you kind of touched on, Cameron, that um, struck a chord with me is now we want to know the best part about my job now is it, it, this is not like a weekly basis, but I would say at least a, a few times a month, I see myself usually on, either on Zoom or in person in a boardroom with a really old school financial institutions group. And they're asking me, how are you doing this like organically? How are you reaching as many families? You know, they want to uh, you know, they're either thinking about investing, they're thinking about, you know, we're, we're thinking about making an enterprise version of our software. Uh, so we're having all these types of conversations. And it's so funny to see all the white hair in the room, the white and silver hair in the room. Yeah. We're like, why? Like, wh they, they just keep saying like, why? Why are people doing this? And I think, and I, and, and, I, and I look at them and I say, instead of asking why to the consumer, why don't you look in the mirror and ask why? Like, why aren't you adopting it? Like, it's one thing if it's a compliance thing. It's another sure. thing if you're the radio generation and you're unwilling to adopt TV yeah. or you're the TV generation and you're unwilling to adopt like the iPhone, iPad generation, right? Like right. every single generation is always told, don't do this. This is wrong. This isn't right. But then give it five, 10 years and it's, it, it's wildly or it's more, yeah. more generally adopted. 
Right. I mean, hey, we we all know the example of Kodak and how they were the biggest yeah. camera company in the world, and we all know how that ended up. So yeah, just really interesting. Um, speaking of that, again, I mean, I know one of your TikToks mentions building wealth earlier on in your career and kind of yeah. setting yourself up for success later on in life. Can you kind of reiterate what that advice is? I mean, of course, a lot of my audience is a young professional, maybe they're first starting to make some money and kind of figuring out how to do everything. But you know, what have you seen is, is a really wise and kind of foundational approach to that? Of course, you know, this isn't financial advice, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. really. And you want to know what? You don't have to do that because technically speaking, Habits is a financial intermediary. And so we're not a whole great investment advisor. So we can actually technically say whatever. But, um, but, but, but where, where you're going at is this is my philosophy. And let me make that like very clear. So sure. my entire banking VC and startup career, I have met hundreds of different people ranging in varied ways of fulfillment and lifestyles. Um, you know, as noted, you know, I grew up in a house where both my parents dedicated themselves to the nonprofit industry. So right. I know what it's like in a single day to go from advising a multinational family office that has billions of dollars um, and, you know, very highly successful businesses tied to their source of wealth to then people who live in section eight housing and almost switching places in my brain because everyone approaches money in the same battle, right. really relative. It all affects yeah. us in some way, shape or form. But the way that I have often have kind of felt is the one thing that everybody has to do and it's a requirement, it gets preached upon as always, but it's boring, it's unsexy. So no one really likes to say it out loud, but it is like long-term financial planning. Like whether you right. want to admit it or not, there is truth and science and data yeah. that validate long-term wealth planning, the compound event or compound effect, and just save really, like invest really enough. Like there's like that, right? Just do it. You know, whether you know what you're doing or not, just put it in your savings account, put it in an investment account, get a robo advisor. It doesn't matter. Come to habits if you have no idea what to do. It's kind of why we have our thing, right? But then yeah. the next area too, and if you're somebody who is, has a high career aspiration, not saying that happy people is defined by wealth, but I don't sure. think that we should, you know, look wrong at people who want right. to get extra credit when it comes to, you know, earning money. And from someone who has done this now for for a few years now, has already started to see the benefits of it. I think whatever you can find yourself being able to assist like other companies and businesses, it's just the easiest way to create wealth. And the reason why I say it's the easiest is just because it takes time. But then once you find your footing, it works out. So the formula in a very long-winded way of me articulating this is long-term boring financial planning, you best really and often, but then get yourself out there, right? You have this YouTube channel, you're you're making ad revenue. When when people maybe reach out to you so want to do sponsorships, like sure, maybe this doesn't generate you, you know, fifteen thousand dollars a day, but maybe in five years it will, maybe in sure. ten years it will, right? You got to start early. Very smart yeah. in investing really and often. What I do though, and this kind of high risk, high reward barbell strategy that I kind of speak to is I love advising uh, early stage companies and, and like a bunch of them are, are right here. Some have yep. raised millions of dollars and, you know, on paper, I have a lot of money. Some are worth zero now, but you want to know what yep. those experiences taught me how to manage and run my own business. But then also it just opened my, my eyes to a world that's a little bit more wild west. And right. when you can get involved in negotiations and you learn to sell yourself and market yourself. If you want to talk about insulation from AI, that's the yeah. place to start. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's super interesting. And it's one of those things. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've been fortunate to have a lot of opportunities to kind of diversify outside of just, you know, the typical nine to five. And I think that's really powerful, not just in terms of income, but in terms of just your own growth and how you see yourself, you know, I'm not just somebody who works at JB Morgan, you know, yeah. there's a lot to me uh, where I think there's a lot of value to that, but you know, kind of still focusing on this, like how could someone, you know, who maybe doesn't have tens of thousands of followers on TikTok or have all this experience already advising companies, you know, what can they do to kind of get themselves out there a little bit more, start kind of being in front of these companies so that one day they can have these conversations about equity? You know, yeah. what would your advice be to someone like that? I I think there's like two things that I would do. And it definitely depends on where you live, but this is when being in person can be very, very effective because it's a very crowded world on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on various social media websites. But you know, obviously don't be afraid to DM. I'll just kind of make that a given. But yeah. every single city in the United States and, and arguably across the planet has some sort of nonprofit investment arm to increase interest in like your city, right? I, I, I'm in Indianapolis today, chasing my girlfriend. 
they, uh, you know, from med rotation to med rotation. TechPoint is the nonprofit arm of the Indiana, or Indiana Economic Development Council. They literally have a war chest of money to attract early stage startups into this area. I go to their events and yeah, I go and I talk to people and I say to them, hey, what's going well? What's not going well? Because you want to know what? If you're an eager student and you have design work or you have basic right. coding skills, okay, maybe it starts off with you just doing some free work and saying, hey, I would love to add value. But you want to know what? When you get involved in a company and you become a part of a process and you come to me and you tell me that you're no longer going to work for habits anymore because you're, you're going to go out of something else. I'm going to be like, no, 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 don't go. Like, let me pay you. Right. What can I get yeah. you? Right. You create leverage. So that's like one area. You go to these events, go meet, go figure it out. But then I think the second part too, and this is the part that I was kind of alluding to there is don't be afraid to do free work. Don't right. be afraid to walk into that mom and pop store at, at a flower shop and, and say, hey, is everything going well? I'm 19 years old. I'm looking for a summer job. I don't need you to pay me. But you know, is there something that you could be doing better? Because you want to know what? You might get a response. You might be also told to F off. But either way, you will learn about what are opportunities that actually make yeah. sense for you and one that don't. I just think people are so scared to get their get, to get themselves yeah. out there. And once you get over that hump, there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, no, totally agree. And yeah, I mean, shout out to, to Indianapolis there. Very, yeah, that's interesting. And something that I think isn't spoken about enough. Yeah. And especially as a college student, there's so many opportunities, you know, not just on the sales side where they want like a college ambassador yeah. for certain things. But, you know, there's just so many fellowships and venture things like growth scouts, things like that, that you can kind of ease your way in there um, that it's just important to take advantage of. But I think that's really um, sound advice. And my actual first internship that I had was with a local hedge fund in Naples. Really? And that was the, yeah. the summer of COVID when it was really, you know, no one knew what was going on. And, you know, I was just like, I really want an internship. I obviously don't have a lot of value to provide, but yeah. I, you know, I'm a hard worker. I, I would do anything. And so I kind of drafted up this really great cover letter explaining my story. And I reached out to, I think I literally just looked up investment firm Naples and yeah. went through the list. And from there, I actually ended up getting an internship because someone just really connected with what I said in the email and wanted to give me that opportunity. And kind of similar to what you said, I, mean, I wasn't paid for that, but I was still able to, you know, kind of put in the grunt work, do some additional research for them that, that helps what they were doing. But it's like, there's so much opportunity there. You know, if, if you're at home and you, you realistically don't have a lot of responsibilities, financially speaking, you know, it's totally okay to, to work for free and to, to say that, yeah. so, you know, a, a lot of times that, that opens the doors a lot more um, than anything else. So I think that's yeah. something that a lot of people don't think of doing and, you know, maybe have it in their ego where they're like, ah, I got to work for money. But, you know, sometimes working for free leads to that much higher paying job down the road. Yeah. And, and I do recognize that sometimes it's not economically feasible, right? Because you got to pay sure. for people. Like we, we've had a couple uh, interns at Habits that we did pay and, and were great, but they're like, look, I would love to dedicate more time to you guys, but I work at Starbucks because I'm paying right. for school. And it's like, you know, we, we don't have the budget to pay you, you know, another like $2,000 uh, $2, more a month. Like that, that's, that's a lot to ask even at a startup. Right. But, yeah. um, you know, one thing that you kind of reminded me of, I mean, like how I got my state farm internship, I was working in the mail between yeah. my like freshman year and sophomore year, I think, or maybe between my sophomore year and junior year of college. And I walked into a state farm agency and said like, hey, do you guys need help with anything? And like the guy looked right. at me weird and said like, well, we could we could use somebody who could smile and dial. And I didn't really know what he meant by that. But I literally yeah. called for these people. I did it for free for the first couple of weeks. But you want to know what? I worked my butt off. And I did a yeah. really good job at it. And then I went back to him and I said like, hey, I'm willing to continue to do this, but like you need to pay me like 20 bucks an hour. And he said, sure. well, how about this? And I don't want to get anyone in trouble because I won't use specific names. <laughs> he goes, how about this? I'll pay you 15 bucks an hour, but it'll be cash. And I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and like things like that to one other just quick example, literally this kid, speaking of ways that you can get in front of people virtually, still recommending to go in person if you can, but virtually, this one kid sent me like the cold email of a lifetime and it totally blew my socks off. And it immediately validated that this is somebody who is highly talented because you can tell a lot about somebody by how they approach something and right. really just show show who they are in that first touch point. And immediately I booked time with them. And yep. I'm talking with them on Monday. And who knows, maybe the the first, you know, couple months of his engagement with habits, if in the event it makes sense to to bring him on, maybe it's for free, but you want to know what? 
people who bring something to the table who make it really difficult to imagine life without of, right? it's easy just to throw money at it to keep that problem from becoming a bigger one. Well, speaking of that and kind of just the intern and your hiring process at Habits, I saw a post on, on LinkedIn that you have a, a bit of a unique strategy yeah. to that. Would love for you to kind of talk a little bit more about that. I think it's a really cool approach and something that I've seen observed in some aspects of my life with respect to other things, but yeah, would love to just learn a little bit more about why you decided to go down that path and kind of how it's evolved for you and been beneficial for the team. Yeah, it. Um, we do things differently at Habits, and and we do that because I mean I'm a different guy, and my co-founder is, is is different, and we want to build the team that we know will build a strong culture because that's very very important to us. We like humbled, hardworking. We don't care if you're the smartest. We want you if you got high work ethic, you're curious. And when you think of a problem, you don't think about how do I, you, you don't bring the problem to the table. You say, hey, here's the problem, but here's the solution that I think is going to be the best result because I've already done X, Y, and Z to support this argument. That's what we look for. So how we do it at Habits is it starts with a three-month unpaid apprenticeship. Um, we don't care if you have a full-time job and you can only spend an hour with us. Or if you're somebody who is a full-time student and you just want to use us for academic credit and you have no intention of working with us in the law. But the reason why we do the three-month apprenticeship is because it's either my co-founder or I, one of us will be the direct manager and correspondent. And uh, we work with them on a weekly basis. You get 30 minutes of dedicated time with the, you know, the CEO or the CTO yeah. of the business. We're there to mold you and grow you, but also to put you in really uncomfortable situations that you are forced to put together your own like, you know, OKRs and KPIs. And if you're not sure what those are, it's basically metrics to evaluate, have you delivered on some sort of objective that we set? So for some people, maybe it's sales, sales oriented, maybe it's conversion oriented, maybe it's product oriented. Right. We're doing this right now with probably five to six people at a time, you know, between my co-founder and I. So we have at yep. least one morning where we're doing this because that's how invested we are with the future of our team. So that yep. when, you know, since we're in the middle of a raise right now, we can deploy that capital towards areas that we know that are going to be catalysts to the growth of the business. And I think yep. the, the feedback that we get from people is like, why? And it's because, all right, now when you join Habits, we know that you've brought something to the table. You right. probably have thick skin because Vera, my co-founder and I, you know, we're not here to tell you good job. We're here to tell you how you can be a better version of yourself and how you can be a bigger asset to the company. And on, a, and on top of that, then when you join, you just have this immediate immense like respect from the team because everybody's been through it. Vera and I both for a very long time worked over nights and weekends. We're not paid to do so. And right. we had to eat what we kill. And I know that sounds like a little, um, you know, aggressive to say that out loud, but we're aggressive people. And yeah. to be a part of a fast growing business, you have to have this like resiliency, self, self sufficiency, and right. willingness to kind of go the extra mile without a lot of direction. And we think that, yeah. that the apprenticeship program is the best way for us to kind of evaluate that. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think it's a really cool opportunity for people, especially at an early stage startup that maybe if they didn't have this, like, or if you didn't have this apprenticeship program where you go a few months without pay, like you wouldn't have interns. You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. we, I think a lot of people are in that stage where it's like, I would love it, but I can't pay. So we're just not going to have interns. And so for you, it's kind of a, a sweet spot there. And then also just for the actual people going through the apprentice, you know, it builds that self-confidence in themselves. Like, wow, look at me, look at what I was able to do. And that then, you know, they can leverage when they actually start and they know that they can actually do the job, which, you know, can be super fulfilling for a lot of people. So I think yeah. that's a great approach. Um, transitioning to the last question, you've, you've ha spent your career in many different subsets of finance. You've learned a lot, you've met a lot of people. You know, for someone who is maybe five years younger, just looking to start their career and doesn't know where to go, but has a lot of opportunity, what would be your advice, you know, to somebody who just wants to feel fulfilled and also know that they're, you know, making a relatively wise decision? Wow, that is such a good question. <laughs> I, I'm sure, yeah, that's the answer we all want to know. But yeah, yeah, well, well, here, you know what? What I do is let me uh, actually like open this up. So I, I'm a big like journal or right. I, I carry one with me everywhere with every company like over there on like my bookshelf. I have like four or five other journals because I carry them with me because it's just more of everything that I have in here. And it's not structured. It's not like I'm, you know, writing dear diary, but at the end of every book, I have either post-its or 
written down things that have kind of stuck with me like throughout this year. So that's, this is just 2024 alone, right? And you probably saw, yeah. I don't know, like 30 things there already. Um, I think the, the key thing that I would say to anybody, because the question was more around like the fulfilling life or lifestyle and things like that. Sure. Do one of two things. One, schedule send emails to yourself, to like your future self for like six months or 12 months from now with where you expect to be and what you would have expected to accomplish. Because it forces you then to document where you want your life to go and progress. Right. And sometimes those change. Right. Sure. Maybe you wanted to be in the JP Morgan investment bank, but in reality, you actually wanted to go to the KPMG like consulting route, you know, like whatever it is, I guess, flip those in your case. But, you know, um, because now, right, you, you have something that you can evaluate. Right. What I personally like to do is every six months, I write down five very, very simple goals. It's across both my personal and professional life. So like the ones that I have here is, you know, I wanted to complete heart 75. I wanted to uh, move in with my girlfriend. Um, I wanted to secure a lead investor and we're really close to that. So uh, hopefully I'm going to check that out soon. Uh, from a content and like growth perspective, I'd like goals for TikTok and for you know, other various platforms with habits, myself personally related. And then uh, oh, oh, and the last one uh, is completely related to like right now I take reduced pay. And so I want to raise my salary because I want to move back to like New York or move to like Denver, a more high costing city. And, you know, if we're going to do that, I'm going to want to live in a nicer apartment than I do today. Yeah. But, but I, I share those with you because if you are somebody young and you are somebody who wants to be very intentional about your next steps forward, you have to lay the foundation. You have to know where to evaluate and have some sort of milestone or objectives that you can define that this was successful or maybe I made a different choice or it wasn't successful. So that would be my long-winded uh, yep. advice on an unsolicited, I mean, I mean, I guess on a more blanket statement approach. Yeah. Well, I think that's extremely valuable. And of course, everybody has big aspirations. They, they want to accomplish X and Y. But if you're not writing down what those things are, you know, it's easy to go six months and be like, oh, did I actually accomplish what I was looking for or not? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've always been a strong advocate for writing down your goals. And I, I, yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that I, I still struggle with at times in terms of yeah, there's there's a few different perspectives where it's like, keep your goal to yourself. Yeah, don't tell anybody. And then also there's the side where it's like, tell people because then they can hold you accountable. So I'm, I'm still like kind of in between the two of those for, for things. But um, really appreciate you coming on. Really appreciate the transparency with that. For for everybody watching, where can they go to support you? Where can they learn more about habits? This is the time to to plug all of that information. I would just say both socials are Jack underscore Boudreaux underscore. Um, but, you know, don't be a stranger. If you just look up Habits Inc. on LinkedIn or go to www.myhabits.io, you'll find some way to get in contact with me. And if there's one thing I could say, just generally speaking, is don't be a stranger. If I could ever be a resource to you, Cameron, or to any of you listening, um, you know, I would love to see how I can be of assistance. Yeah. Well, really appreciate it, Jack. Uh, happy Friday and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Appreciate it. Great being here. Thank you.